started. We were saying how excited we were to see what scent you selected. What is this? Because I can smell it. It's a combination of two. So it's Cassili by Parfum de Marly and Mm -hmm. Delina Exclusive by Parfum de Marly. Yeah. Wow. A combination of two. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. I really need to. Like, well, I need to get I smell more like than New one York scent, trash. <laughs> so I can mix and match my scent. The thing is, I have so many that I'm just like, I'm not gonna get through them if I'm just like, yeah, let me just like use one. So I like like to layer. That's for that practical. Reason. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's practical. Yeah, I love it. Well, you smell beautiful. Thank you. I can smell you from here. You smell like you're about to um, go to the Polo Classic and have a wonderful time. Thanks. Thanks. Um. Well, welcome. Hello. Thank Welcome. you. Welcome. I'm so, I hope you're not flustered. No, but not like, at all. I'm okay, great. great. I'm amazing. Wonderful. I'm telling myself I am. <laughs> but you are. You really are. We we obviously took a really um, big deep dive into you, you, your background. So, Innie, welcome. Thank you. Innie is a Nigerian-American beauty, style, and lifestyle blogger. She went to the Spence School. Thereafter, she attended Harvard for undergrad and then went to Columbia Law School. She has also showcased her experience from law school to big law on TikTok. So, Annie, on your TikTok, you open up about being an overachiever. What was it like growing up in a Nigerian household? What were the expectations your family set for you? And how did you balance those with what you were interested in pursuing? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think especially Nigerians get like a really like there's a big stereotype. It's not even a stereotype because it's true. (laughs) Lawyer, doctor, engineer, like those are the three, those are the only ways you can make your, your family proud. Um, and it's interesting because I honestly put a lot of pressure on myself, like even Mm -hmm. without, um, my mom who raised me, um, putting pressure on me to be anything in particular, it was very clear that education was important. Like that was like, crystal clear um we had a whole set of encyclopedias and like a big you know two volume dictionary and like if I didn't know what a word meant my mom like instead of telling me would be like there's a dictionary Mm. right there like go look it up um which was very helpful one because I learned how to look up words in a dictionary um but I also became curious and wanted to just learn about things for the sake of learning about things Um, but it's funny because I don't know when it shifted, but at some point it came, it like, at some point it became me putting pressure on myself Mm -hmm. and less so my mom. So before I went to, to Spence, I did a program called prep for prep, which is like how a lot of like New York city kids who are gifted and talented, like go on the pipeline to, um, private school or, you know, prep schools in the city. And I one from a really young age wanted to go to Harvard. Like that was mm-hmm. like my thing. And I had a big crystal clear plan. <laughs> I'm going to do the specialized high school. We're going to do, or maybe I'll go to Hunter and then we'll, you know, that'll be the path that I take to Harvard. But prep for prep came along when I was in the fifth grade. And like it says in their thing, like, you know, kids from our program have gone on to attend Harvard, Yale, Penn, whatever. I saw Harvard and I was like, okay, well, this is the plan now. Like, this <laughs> yeah. is what we're doing. Yeah. And to get my mom to go to the introductory meeting, I had to beg her. She had just had my um, younger twin brothers. And so mm-hmm. it was a big ask for her to, you know, trek from Queens to the Upper West Side. And it, like the story, and I vividly remember being like, can you please like go to the meeting? Like, please, like they say these mm-hmm. kids like go to these schools, like please go. And so that was more so me begging my mom yeah. to take up something that I really wanted mm-hmm. to do that was more work. So I guess the balance um, sort of came from having the, the freedom to explore and to be curious, but also knowing that education was really important and that came directly from my mom I love that shout out to our moms shout out to mom <laughs> yeah. and so you started your journey as a creator while you were in law school before, before going law school. into law school yeah. so I'm curious when we think about stuff that is required versus stuff that isn't required obviously documenting your life online isn't so I'm curious what inspired you on the path to becoming a creator and how at the beginning did you navigate balancing that and applying for law school as well yeah so I started creating I fell into it Mm -hmm. I moved back home to New York City after college and on Sundays my family went to church and growing up like a church on Sunday was like the opportunity to dress up and it was also my only opportunity to wear anything other than uniform because I wore uniform to school and so I really looked forward to Sundays as an opportunity to you know wear my best outfits look great and Um, I missed the culture of New York that allowed you to be extra Mm. in a way. And so when I moved back home, 
I was like, great. Um, every Sunday after church, I just like took photos and posted them on Instagram. And after like a couple of months of doing that, like my friends who were my followers, but like they were all my friends at the time, um, took note and were like, yeah, we were waiting for Sunday. Like we knew you'd come to like uh -huh. every single Sunday yeah. became something that they like expected. And a friend came up with like the name any given Sunday. And I was like, oh, like absolutely. Um, and naturally by putting pressure on myself, which is what I tend to do, I was like, all right, we have a deadline. Like, either, <laughs> you know, after ab about around the time of like a year of doing this, like by the time this hits a year of you posting your Sunday Instagram posts, like either you take this seriously and start a journey or you let it go. Um, and so I was just uh, like, I'm going to start a blog. Like, I'm just going to start a blog because it'll be my own because mm -hmm. I like to write, but also like, I'll like buy the domain and that'll, that kind of marks the start of a creator journey. It's like, if I tell you I have a website and like check out my blog post, mm -hmm. like that's like, oh yeah, she's a content creator. Yeah. Um, so I started a blog and I was in at the end of my first year of teaching when I started that, because I was a teacher before I went to law school. And it really just became a chance for me to document like what I was experiencing as a black woman in my 20s in New York who had just graduated college, like all of those things. When it came to balancing, it's really interesting because there's always like a fine line of you know, maintaining privacy, but also like sharing your journey authentically. And I really didn't share much about my law school application process, for example, mm -hmm. like on my blog, because I don't know the outcome. And I'm the type of person mm -hmm. who likes to share about things once I've already experienced them. Mm -hmm. right. um, and so like, I really didn't say much, like I didn't really post that I was taking the LSAT. I didn't really post that I um, was applying to law school until I got in the acceptances that I was looking for. And I was like, all right, like now we can announce and now we can <laughs> talk and now we can reflect and mm -hmm. all of those things. But when it came to balancing, like in law school, before law school, I guess having a strict schedule really helped. But like the people who were helping me get content were like my little brother who would take my photos. And I guess it helped because I can just like, you know, anytime I'd be like, hey, what are you doing on Saturday? Like, all right, let's go. Like, like <laughs> let's go do a photo shoot. Like, I'll feed you. I'll pay you. Like, we'll, we'll, we oh. got it. Um, and so really just being able to have people around me being in New York and staying in New York for law school really helped because, um, you know, one, New York is a great city to be regardless, but it was also home for me. So I had my little brother still taking my photos and all of those things. So really just, I guess, a level of sacrifice as well. I feel like, you know, there was a level of, do I want to go out on Thursday night or, or Friday night, or do I want to work on a blog post or pack my bag for a photo shoot? And oftentimes I chose that because that was what was really important to me at the time. And I honestly think like it was worth it looking back. That's really, I think that's really interesting that you say that. And obviously it's probably allowed you to kind of have your toes dipped into both sides. And so I'm curious, did was there a shift? So once you graduated from law school, you knew you were going to take the bar, you knew you were prepping, interviewing to go into, um, to start your career. Was there a shift or if, and if there was a shift, what did that look like? Was it, I'm devoting X amount of my time to work and this is going to be on in the background or I'm doing what I love across, putting my all into both things. Like, what did that look like? Yeah, so the shift, I would say, started to happen when I, like, signed to an agency, um, mm -hmm. a management agency. And it wasn't even like I really was doing anything differently because I would always be very clear about the fact that, like, school came first, and then when I started work, work came first, and when I was studying for the bar, that studying for the bar came first. So, like, mm -hmm. at all junctures, uh, my career in law came first, mm -hmm. and I would constantly convey that. To the to people in my, like at my management okay. agency, things like that. Like, Hey, I can't really do this thing because like I'm studying or I can't mm -hmm. really go here because, you know, my schedule or classes, but it did mark a shift because I feel like that's when like, you know, typically people who are full-time creators or things like that, like they are signed to agencies and it, it's, there's a clearer path of making money. And so that was about the beginning of the shift for me where I was like, Oh, like, I was doing this for fun. I was doing this to main, like, you know, to, to have brunch change, like, you know, to yeah. be able to, you know, travel and to be able to, to, to be able to support the fun stuff that I did while in law school. But now I'm like, oh, like this is the numbers are larger and this is something that is serious. Um, and it's not like I wasn't taking it seriously before, but now it's like, okay, like when you're making a serious amount of money, it's like, all right, like let's take it seriously. In terms of time, not much really changed. But the second part of the shift, I would say for me was 
the time between when I took the bar exam and actually started work yeah. at the law firm, uh, because that was the time period where I was like, I could operate as a full-time content creator. Like it was about, I want to say, I took the bar exam at the end of July and started work at the end of October. So about wow. two ish months of just, mm -hmm. you know, not having anything to do. And I was like, great, like this is the time period where I'm going to, you know, play, f I'm going to cosplay as a full-time content creator mm -hmm. and do that. And it was fun. And I was able to support myself and it was, you know, it was like, Oh, like I'm fine. Like I can do this, but I'm still going to, you know, start work in October, but like I'm fine. And all the things that I thought I wouldn't be able to do during that time period, whether it was support myself through a move travel, I went to Bali, all of those things. I was just like, Oh, like I, this is fine. Like, and this yeah. is also like a career in its in and of itself. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious where that independence and self-starter mentality comes from. Yeah, I would say part of it is innate. And another part of it, I feel like is the byproduct of growing up in New York City. Mm -hmm. Like in a lot of ways, you kind of had no choice. Like, for example, like when people aren't from the city, they'll be like, so like you went to school where? And like, how long did it take you to get to school? And I'd say like, you know, from Queens to the Upper East Side was about 40 minutes, 45 minutes on the subway and then like an extra 15 minutes walking there. Like you did this by yourself. Like, I'm like, yeah, 12 years old. Like you don't really have a choice. <laughs> like, you know, I'm like New York City, they'll give you the student Metro card. So you're, you're free to go. You're ready to go. So in a lot of ways, it's kind of just like, hey, if you want to do something, Thing. sometimes you have to do it by yourself and I think that's kind of just a byproduct of growing up in New York City mm -hmm. and so I'm curious too because obviously I think that you were in a very unique opportunity where you had kind of two paths that you could go down what advice would you give to young professionals who are starting their career and trying to figure out what they want to do with their lives in terms of pursuing that traditional career path versus pursuing or trying to do that whilst also balancing what they're passionate about, what drives them, if that is separate from that traditional career path? Yeah. So I would say one, it's important to try the things that you think you're interested in. Like mm -hmm. I'm in a position now where I'm operating as a full-time content creator, but I'm at least grateful that I had the opportunity to try, you know, working at a law firm mm -hmm. and knowing for myself that like, I didn't really enjoy this and it wasn't mm -hmm. really for me. Um, and so there's no, what if in that regard, there's no, you know, could it have been different or, you know, I didn't give myself the chance to explore. So I would definitely say like, try the things. And that's also true for the opposite, right? Like there's nothing wrong with doing the traditional path, try the thing or try the thing that you think might be your passion or the thing that's creative and see like, am I really trying to put in the work that goes into this? Do I really like the idea of not having a stable check or not having benefits? Like things like, mm -hmm. like, do I really like this lifestyle? Um, and so I think it's really important to, to try the things. Um, but it's really interesting, but also know that eventually, like if you are someone who does both really well, yeah. know that you might have to choose at some point. And that's yeah. not even, um, because anyone will make you choose. That's just because if you're good at multiple things, like an after a certain point in time, like both of them will become so time consuming that it's like you kind of have to choose and pick one. Right. Um, even if it means like even if it means that you don't necessarily like give one up completely, it's like think about what it might look like if you had to choose both, if you really love both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what were some of those factors that encouraged you to select or when you were thinking about it, select one over the other was like comp, but the most important thing was it happiness? Was it being able to be your own boss? I'm yeah. just curious as uh, young people kind of think about that too. Yeah, no, that's really important. Comp was a big factor. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't number one, but it mm -hmm. was, um, if I were in a position where I wasn't making as much as I was, or if m making as much or more as I was at the law firm, mm -hmm. it would have been like a, okay, no question. Like I can't, I'm not ready to, th the outcome would have looked differently. Mm -hmm. Um, but I had a feeling that I didn't necessarily want to be there because while I was at work, I was thinking about the creative stuff. I was wow. thinking about the content. I was getting ideas and I was like, Ooh, like I really wish I could work on this right now, but I can't. So let me like focus on what's in front of me. Um, and then there were opportunities that came up that were really cool. Like, you know, I'm a part of the Sephora squad and in February they had a trip to LA that was on a Tuesday and Wednesday. And I'm like right in the middle of the week <laughs> and I have to be in the office. And I'm just like, yeah, like I can't go. Like I have a full-time yeah. job that's not content creating. And so there were so many things that came up 
that I was just like, oh, like, I really wish I could do this. Mm -hmm. Um, And like, there were so many times where I was willing to put in the work um, on content creation, like all hours of the night, like all anytime, anywhere, but I wouldn't be able to say the same about working at a law firm. Like I wouldn't give up my weekend for the work that I had to do at a law firm, Mm -hmm. but I would give up my weekend for the work that I had to do as a content creator. And I think that was like a really big difference. Like I know no one like wants to work all the time. Um, but like, what are the things that you're willing to really like spend time doing? Ooh, I love, I love how you're thinking about this too, especially in terms of like, where does that time go that I feel like is most valuable to me? And I feel like it's a really good segue into my next question, which is as someone who has achieved success in multiple fields, like what are some of the key practices or habits that, or what are some of the key habits that you're practicing on a daily that have helped you succeed in both like your legal career while you were in it and as a creator? Yeah. So I don't know if this is a practice as much as I realize like there's a lot of like mental self-talk that has to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, Like pep talks that I have to give myself like where I'm like I'm tired but it's like you like come on like we really have to do this. Like I'll literally be at home by myself and be like we we really need to do this. Like this has to happen now. Um, And I think that like yeah I think people underestimate how much like constantly talking to yourself and boosting yourself up and hyping yourself up, um, how far that goes and just getting you further towards your journey. I am also someone who likes to just writes a lot of things down. Um, if I, if there's an idea that I have or something like it automatically has to go in the notes app or has Mm. to go, um, on paper in a notebook just to, to not lose that idea. Um, I like to wake up early and I honestly made that switch. I wake up at like five, five thirty in the morning every I day. I saw that and my I was goal. like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> but Literally you know what's funny? What time are you going to bed? Like ten, ten thirty. Oh. But the thing is, yeah. I made that switch because when I started my job, like I would like wake up six thirty, seven, you know, whatever. But when I started my like job at the law firm, I was like, I'm not going to have time to do all of the things that I want to do. The end of the day is too unpredictable, but I can control the start of my day. Mm. Um, and like if I wake up at five, five thirty, no one's going to be up. No one's going to be sending emails back and forth. So that was my only option. It was yeah. like you have to wake up early if you still want to do the content, if you still want to go to the gym if you still want to, you know, be able to have your morning tea and journal and meditate and all of those things. So yeah, waking up early has been a big one for me, but I will say I had the, the momentum of jet lag from when I came back from Bali that I used to, to jumpstart my waking up early. So, so everybody should go to Bali Bali. (laughs) just to like reset our clock. Some Mm -hmm. that happened to me for probably a day yeah. and then I was out <laughs> and you're like ready. done yeah done. and Dang. I think that it, it gives a good point which is navigating the dynamic of older people and younger pl- people at work so bringing your full self to work kind of what does that mean to you as a content creator versus when you were in law because I think being corporate girlies former co- corporate girlies that we all were kind of showing your showcasing your creativity and kind of who you are isn't beneficial at the office. It is not at all. And I like was the top of the not bringing my full self to work, especially mm-hmm. because I was a content creator. Like I would walk around the office very paranoid, like mm-hmm. about like who saw what I did. And it's not like I post anything crazy or, but it's just like, Oh, like, now you know I went to brunch over the weekend and like are you going to judge me because I wasn't like billing hours over the weekend Mm -hmm. like those sorts of things um and even not even like and so for that reason like not even being able to mention like things that I would do out of fear that it would be used against me at some later point Mm -hmm. um and I think like the things that you do the things that you spend your time on like speak to who you are Mm -hmm. um and so by not being able to at least share that on a day-to-day basis like I wasn't able to bring that part of myself to work but as a content creator like there are really no limits there Mm -hmm. there I could share as much or as little as I want um and so in that way I feel like I'm able to to bring my full self to work in a way Mm -hmm. but it's interesting because the the equivalent or the thing that could potentially impede or serve as like a barrier to that are like when you work with brands right mm-hmm. like sure as a content creator you might be able to bring your full self online but if you're trying to make money is every single brand or is every single brand that you might want to work with going to want to align with 
who you are, who you truly are and who mm-hmm. you like, who your full self is that you bring online. Um, I never do anything for the sake of like making sure that I'm like, you know, brand safe or anything yeah. like that. But I do think that's actually something that like doesn't really get spoken about enough that like, you know, there is in some way a possibility that you don't bring your full self to work because you're like, I want to be able to work with this brand or I want to be mm-hmm. able to get endorsements or deals and things like that. So mm. that's really interesting. I hadn't really thought of that until this moment. What, so sorry, what do you mean by brand safe? Like you haven't thought about anything that's brand safe. Yeah, I think people like, I think I've heard the term on TikTok at some mm-hmm. point, like whether or not someone's like brand safe, like, so maybe, um, so something that may not, a person who may not be considered brand safe is like someone who maybe um, uses curse words a lot or someone who uh, maybe their appearance or like they wear certain clothes that, you know, like, mm-hmm. so sometimes I'll say instead of like, you know, trying to speak hypothetically, like mm-hmm. sometimes I'll get a brand brief and they'll be like, no cleavage or no this uh, or you know no profanity no this that, and the third make sure you're not showing too much skin make sure your nails are certain like are not too distracting like things like that yeah sometimes because they want the, the focus on the product and even though that's in a brief for a specific campaign right. I find it hard to imagine that those aren't conversations that are happening in rooms when they're mm-hmm. trying to pick right. content creators to work with and to to do brand to do deals with so yeah Oh, that's interesting. I never thought about that either. And how much of your time do you spend consuming content versus creating content? Yeah. Um, I honestly feel like these days I spend a lot more time consuming, which is like I'm trying to limit it in a way because I don't feel like I get that much inspiration from consuming content, which a lot of sometimes I do. Like sometimes I might if I'm looking for like a product or I'm like, okay, this product is like new or trending or things like that. But so I would say it's hard to separate the two. (laughs) It really is hard to separate the two because when I think about it, it's like, I'm creating content like when I wake up and I'm like, you know, showing my gym routine or something. I'm Mm -hmm. creating content when I'm pouring water in a glass or something, you know, when I'm doing all of the things. And so I guess in that way, I probably create more than I consume because Mm -hmm. it's like I can't be on TikTok while filming. I can't be on TikTok while editing a video. Mm -hmm. Um, So I would say the ratio is probably close two to one maybe three to one creating versus consuming well it is funny because brie is more of a content creator than i am and i tell you trends yeah yeah, i'm like there's this trend on tiktok that blah 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 blah, and you're like i have no idea who you're talking about or what is happening i get very fatigued from consuming content Mm -hmm. because like you said everything that you could be doing in a day feels like oh this is an opportunity for me to create content um, so like we were just talking this morning, I haven't been on TikTok in weeks, which is mm. kind of normal, not normal, but it's just, it can feel so exhausting sometimes because if I do jump on, there could be days where I'll be on there for like an hour or two hours. I'm like, mm. Oh, I'm catching up. Yep. Same thing with Instagram. If I'm not on for a long time, I feel like now I have to catch up on everything I didn't consume, mm-hmm. which is tiring. tiring. It's tiring. So I just, I'm like, okay, let's just stay off of it. <laughs> so moving forward. You have this amazing solo series where you take yourself on dates. You also don't go on dating apps other than Raya. Correct. So (laughs) tell me a little bit about what you're looking forward to when it comes to your love life in this next year. I'm looking forward to just like having fun Mm -hmm. and just like saying yes when it makes sense. Um, Honestly and truly like... Yeah, I've, I have started like a soul date series and it's been like cool to just like be like, what's going to happen today? Like, what's the mm-hmm. vibe? Like, mm-hmm. you know, I studied sociology in college. So like it's like it's like in my nature to kind of be like, OK, like what are the observations? Like what what are the trends that we're seeing? <laughs> like, what can we take away from this? Which is like really bad because it's just like not everything needs to be analyzed. But yeah, I'm really just excited. I'm trying to open myself up to being in new spaces and meeting new people. Um, So that's like what I'm most excited about. And I'm thinking about Raya. I still haven't, like, I've never met anyone off of a dating app, like, Mm -hmm. in real life. Mm -hmm. Because I am the type of person that just prefers to meet someone in person. Like, I already know if I'm attracted to you because I already saw you. Like, I know your height. Like, there's some level of already, like, familiarity and things like that. And so it's really difficult for me to go from, like, seeing someone on an app like Raya. um, And, (laughs) and, like, being like, yeah, like, let's meet up or whatever. Um, So I'm 
that's kind of where the inspiration for the just like being out and like solo dates and, you mm-hmm. know, working from a, a cafe or working from a hotel um, rooftop or things like that comes from. Cause it's like, I'm really comfortable at home, but like if I, if I know I'm the type of person that prefers to meet people outside, like yeah. then I need to be outside. Ooh. Outside. We need to tell our single friends that. Yeah. Because I think it's so easy to be single and be like, okay, well I have things that I could be focusing on that are in front of me. So you're not putting yourself outside as much if mm-hmm. that's how you want to meet people, which mm-hmm. is naturally and organically. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then my last question for you is whenever you do go on these solo dates, like what is what is the best part about being on your solo date? What do you enjoy most about your solo dates other than having people approach you to pay for them? <laughs> Um, I just enjoy like conversation. Like this past week I went on a solo date and I met someone who was traveling from the Netherlands and like, we just like got to chatting and like, I'm never going to see that person again. But like, it was just like, Oh, like you cross paths with people. It's like, you know, the, the, the movie that is life, you know, where everyone's the main character, but like everyone's plot, like intersects Mm -hmm. or interacts with each other. And it's just like really fun to think of it that way. So I really enjoy just getting to meet new people. I want to become, but this is the thing. So this is probably my main character syndrome, like coming out right now. But like, I also like want to become like a regular at somewhere. You you know, those people who like walk in somewhere and they're like, yeah, like this is the bartender. Like, yeah, like literally like, oh, I know the hostess. Like, hey, she's back again. Like whatever. Like I also just like want to like get to know people. Like Mm -hmm. it's cool to get to know people and to cross cross paths with people you'll never see again but it's also good to like be known like it yeah. feels good to be known um mm-hmm. and to have some level of familiarity with like the people and places and spaces that you're in so yeah. I'm also really excited to like pick a couple of places that I might go to like once a week and like become a regular oh I love you that. know where that is for me well I have two places number one is chopped and fat I <laughs> <laughs> love Shut it up. like the Do you know I don't think though. I don't no, think no, that's I what Annie had in mind I know that's not what you meant and ha- had in mind but like the person that checks me out's like Hey, how are you doing? I thought I saw something. you this weekend. <laughs> yeah, no, but that, like, but yeah. feel good. Like, See it you feels tomorrow. Good. Yeah. yeah, it's like, awesome. <laughs> And I yeah. love it. So oh, I love it. Don't, what's don't the other problem. What's the other place for you? The other one was Raul's. And I was mm. really good friends with the bartender. See? Love and it. he would always make me this drink. And then we would have endless drinks. And then we had too many drinks. <laughs> and, you know, you, ro- you roll out and you're like, oh, my gosh, what time is it? Yeah. Um, and sometimes the bill does not reflect the number of drinks that you had. Exactly. That has happened before. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Except for the one time whenever the bartender that did recognize me came out while I was at a group dinner and was like, weren't you here by yourself the other like <laughs> the other week? And I was like, well, you don't have to say it like well, that. I was that. enjoying myself <laughs> yeah. last week. We were enjoying each right. other's company last week. Like, mm-hmm. huh? Mm-hmm. But... Any, thank you so much for coming in. Um, I know you have some events to go to and some fun to be had today, so don't want you to lose out on that, but really appreciate it. Really appreciate you coming in. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. This is so fun. I love it here. Okay, good. Come back. (laughs) 